All right, everybody, thanks for being here today. I'm uh, now going to call the House Transportation Committee to order. First item on the agenda is a request for introductions of uh, bills. Do we have any bill introductions? Come forward, sir. Yeah. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, I'm Jeff Wagenman. I'm with Steve Kearney and Associates. We're representing the Kansas County Treasurer Association, and we would like to introduce 23RS0142, a bill concerning transparency in motor vehicle fees. Okay, without objection, the bill is introduced. Sir? Any other bill introductions? Uh, Representative Auerkamp? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ask for RS0438 to be introduced. This is a bill that would require tow companies and agencies to get a certificate of title before they sell the vehicles. Currently, they get a possessory lien affidavit and they can sell it with that. Um, the problem that we see with salvage yards is if the possessory lien affidavit paperwork is not filled out properly, salvage yard's not able to get a title, which they now need in order to end of life that vehicle. Hey, are there any objections to the bill introduction? Representative Hall Heisel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Francis, is this, um, or Representative Auerkamp, I'm sorry, is this yeah, similar to what we did France. last year, two years ago? Do we have something similar to that? The pretty much exact language was introduced, I believe it was last year, we did have, the, the chair had a hearing on this bill. Uh, the bill died in, or the bill never made it out of committee. I don't believe it was worked. Okay. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Any objections? Okay. Without objection, the bill's introduced. Other bill introductions. Representative Hall Heisel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a Go back and look at my email. I do have one, RS0512. Uh, this has to do with distinctive license plates and the ability to personalize those plates. RS0512. Is there any objection? Okay, without, it, in, without objection, the bill is introduced. Any other bill introductions? Uh, Come to the mic, Captain. Good afternoon. Mitch Clark with Kansas Highway Patrol. Uh, this is RS0073. Uh, this is an act concerning traffic regulations, increasing penalties for operating a vehicle in excess of 30 miles per hour over the speed limit. Hey, okay. anybody have any questions? Any objections? There's no objection, then the bill's introduced. Busy day in committee today already, guys and girls. Um, any other bills to be introduced? Okay. There's no other uh, bill introductions. We'll uh, get right into the uh, presentations today. Today, uh, committee, we're going to have some presentations on broadband, middle mile fiber, um, one of the reasons that we're looking at this is KDOT's got an internal program where they fund some of this middle mile fiber. And uh, as I've come to ask more and more questions about this middle mile fiber, I've started to understand how important it is to uh, lower cost and provide access of broadband across the state. So uh, if you're wondering why we're doing something on fiber, that is the primary reason. So our first presenter today is... Uh, Mr. Corey Davis, he's the Director of uh, Multimodal uh, Transportation and Innovation with the uh, Kansas Department of Transportation. Welcome to the committee, Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Technology is great, but sometimes uh, it's always hard to get it started. I have to give a PowerPoint uh, tomorrow and I'm having uh, anxiety. Uh, yeah, about it. Okay. All right, now we're settled. Um, Corey Davis, uh, Director of Multimodal Transportation and Innovation with KDOT. Happy to be here with you all to 
outline our efforts and initiatives tied to broadband and fiber. As you all may know, we have the Ike Transportation Program, a 10-year transportation program for the state. Um, two key programs, and I will need to note the um, air on the screen. There should be 100 million. Um, so that's Preservation Plus. As we um, invest in preserving our highway infrastructure, we have an opportunity at that same time to um, install and design conduit and fiber to expand uh, broadband across the state. We kind of view our right of way as key corridors for expansion and opportunities for enhanced connectivity. And I'll talk briefly about uh, the transportation benefits and um, the additional broadband benefit benefits here shortly. Also included in that in the Ike program is 85 million for broadband expansion, for which we partner heavily with Commerce and Jade's team, and she'll get into some more details uh, here soon. Uh, we have three three years of five million dollars worth of funding, and the final seven are 10 million, and that's for expansion of broadband. Uh, we work with Commerce to program those projects and identify the the key areas where broadband expansion is needed, and and help facilitate that back to the fiber installation tied to what we do at KDOT. There's that $100 million over the life of the program. So we have $10 million annually to expand um, our fiber and, and broadband network. So what this does is allows us um, at KDOT to take advantage of any transportation technologies that uh, can be brought upon uh, from fiber uh, and broadband installation. And I'll, I'll provide some examples of, of what that can do here shortly. Installing fiber and conduit on our right of way allows for those middle mile connections. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, so it's the key corridors. We can expand more throughout the state if we advance these initiatives and install this conduit while we're already in the ground. Um, you'll see here on the map, these are our freight routes of significance. Um, so we've identified these as key corridors across the state, and our efforts are tied to primarily focus on these corridors as we expand. Um, and then as we are successful, uh, we can move forward to other corridors, which brings me to the Middle Mile Partnership. Uh, we partnered with Commerce to submit a grant, and what that would do was hopefully leverage our state funds, if we're awarded, to go beyond that primary network and build out more of our highway corridors, allowing for expansion of uh, tra transportation technologies and broadband to our communities. I want to highlight our Dig Once strategy. This is where we can really form partnerships and work with our, our public and, and private entities to um, find efficiencies in, in, in the work we do. Uh, we call it dig once. If we're in the ground, uh, we, we've got an open trench, we need to look at the opportunity uh, to have a partner, whether it's an a internet service provider or, or another technology provider. Let's, let's dig once and share those costs. Um, it provides efficiency when we are in the design process um, and, and the construction process. Along those same lines, if we are uh, rehabilitating or modernizing a, a roadway, we will also add fiber conduit installation along these key corridors. What that does is while we're designing the roadway, we're also designing uh, the trench process, and there's overall efficiencies in that and the construction. So ultimately, we're looking to take advantage of opportunities to expand this conduit and fiber network um, at the most efficient and effective way possible. An example from the transportation perspective of what this can do, uh, we were awarded a, a federal grant. It's the Great Plains Rural Freight Technology Corridor Project. Um, it's a total of $14 million. Uh, we were awarded nearly $7 million um, of federal funds. We've installed the fiber uh, in the conduit. The federal grant will um, su supply the technologies associated with that. And what's that look like? Uh, it can mean... So many different things. Uh, one thing we're looking at uh, right now of Western Kansas, we get high wind days. Um, we can have sensors out there that provide drivers warnings when winds are at a certain speed. We don't have to touch a computer, we don't have to do anything. The, the technology detects it and uh, allows the, the traveler and traveling public uh, to understand what's happening, which in, increases safety on our corridors as well. Um, this gives us data collection as these feeds um, and connected vehicles use these corridors we can gather data on on how they're interacting with our infrastructure if there's an incident on our roadways these sensors can detect um, a series of vehicles uh, slowing down which allows us to alert drivers um, 
behind them to slow down. So it's really a real time uh, opportunity to understand what's going on with our infrastructure. It allows us to understand if there are, are maintenance issues on a roadway. Uh, if, if we've got a hard braking in a certain zone or we've got a sharp turn and, and we're having issues there, these sensors can gather that in real time, show us what we need to be identifying out in the field. Ultimately, from a transportation perspective and a connectivity uh, perspective, there, the opportunities are endless. Um, you'll see some examples on the screen. Uh, Real-time video, video surveillance can detect um, if there's a wrong way driver. So we can go out and, and identify that and work with our, our enforcement partners uh, to, to make sure they can handle that situation. Dynamic message signs. If right now we have to go in there and manually type out the message we want to see on the sign. We have to understand what the incident is first come back to headquarters and then type in uh, what we need to see on the sign. New technologies will um, do that all automatically. Um, we see a, an accident on a roadway, the sensors can detect that. It can bring that to that dynamic messaging sign and, and provide that information to the traveling public. Um, weather, uh, I mentioned the wind uh, warning, um, but all weather types, we can detect um, pavement conditions and, and winter weather um, situations. Um, all of this is really just providing information to um, us internally at KDOT to make decisions uh, in real time, and it provides information for the, the traveling public as well. Um, so that kind of hits on, on the transportation side of things. It's been um, a great experience partnering with Commerce and our internet service providers to look at uh, potential uh, partnerships and cost sharing opportunities. Uh, Thomas is going to speak here shortly. Uh, we've had an active uh, partnership with with him and his group, and we've realized cost savings and realized the opportunities that we have with this technology moving forward. With that, I'll stand for any questions. Okay. Any questions, committee? Representative Delbertine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Corey, appreciate you being here. This may be one you can help with, maybe not, but um, being with, you're actually with KDOT, correct? Okay. I want to say it was a couple of years ago, and we had fiber running down Highway 69 out by Fort Scott area. Um, if memory serves me, it was one of the communities out there was trying, they had leased part of the fiber. It's referred to as an IRU, irrefut irrefutable right of use. So they essentially had full access to a couple pairs or something in the, inside the sheath. They went to try and tap into it to get broadband into the community, only to be stopped by KDOT who said, you, sir, don't have rights to be on our right-of-way because it's not your fiber. Question is, has anything been updated or changed since that? Because if that's still true, we as a state are keeping communities from getting broadband just because of our own little rules here. But yet I understand right-of-way and it's got to be retained. So just anything you'd have on that? Yeah, we have uh, we have been making and continue to make progress on, on those opportunities. And that is the... Um, ultimate goal. As we're putting in conduit along our right away, we want to get to a point where we can share that. Um, there is challenges with uh, leasing and how that uh, situates the Department of Transportation um, being a leasing agent. So we're working through those details, but in any way, uh, we, we don't want to prohibit partnerships. That's, that's what we're all about and looking to tackle those issues. And I will check into that exact issue. And that, that would be just, if you could, I, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. Because if you know, I look at it, if there's fiber availability, there's broad, broadband availability, why are we stopping it? So anything you'd help on that, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next on the agenda, we have Jade Peros, the Director of Broadband for the Kansas Department of Commerce. Welcome to the committee, Jade. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Pardon me. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Francis and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today a little bit about the importance of an open access middle mile broadband network to our office's goal and Kansas's goal to connect everyone with affordable high speed broadband. Uh, my name is Jade Pyrus de Carvalho and I have the honor of serving as your Director of Broadband Development. A strong statewide broadband um, backbone is critical to the success of, is as critical to the success of our state as digital roads are just as important as physical roads to our state's ability to grow and to move goods and services. 
Um, but before we get too far, I'd like to level set with a few definitions. And if this gets too elementary for you, please just stop me. I don't, I don't want to waste your time. But I know we don't talk about broadband a lot in this, in this particular committee. Um, so when most people think of broadband, they think of the connection from their internet service provider into their home or business. Um, and this is known as last mile connectivity. It's what our office's grant programs are focused on, internet from local networks that reach end users. Um, but the internet as a whole is a global network connecting international internet traffic through undersea cables and across land to a national backbone through large population centers. This is sometimes referred to as first mile or national backbone or core network. So you've got that core network and that last mile. But spoking out from that core is a distribution network that connects the backbone to a point in another locality, like a smaller community or maybe an anchor institution, such as a university or a hospital, um, for distribution out to those local last mile connections. So when we're talking about middle mile, we're talking about the section of the broadband network that connects the first mile, which is that national or core network, to the last mile network, which brings internet directly into your homes and businesses. So say you're a provider in the Topeka area and you hear of an unserved area around liberal. You can't just provide last mile services out of the ether in liberal if your network is all centered over here in Topeka. You could either run your own middle mile from Topeka to liberal, which would be cost prohibitive, or you could tap into middle mile near liberal from an incumbent middle mile provider and build out last mile. However, interconnecting or tapping into that incumbent middle mile provider is also very expensive. Um, middle mile network customers that are typically those broadband providers pay monthly wholesale or transit fees for the lease of an amount of network capacity. And that adds to really high operational expenditure OPEX costs that are passed on to the customer in the form of high monthly service costs, or the costs just make the business case undoable, which is why we have a digital divide in many rural areas. The wholesale bandwidth costs from incumbents, which can range up to a dollar per megabit plus transport costs, make rural broadband unsustainable and expensive. Even if companies are highly subsidized for last mile build out, um, the long term business case on the OPEX side isn't sustainable. So for instance, if, if our office invests heavily to the tune of 90 plus percent on the CapEx deployment cost, we do a, law, a, a big grant for the deployment. Um, companies are still forced to charge high costs for basic internet service just to get the OPEX case to pencil out. We just administered um, something called our Capital Projects Fund grant program, and we provided a sliding scale grant um, subsidy, I guess, or, or public um, cost. So the higher the cost per premise, i.e. the more rural, the higher the public investment we made. But we still had providers that they said they'd need to charge $110 monthly or just a 100 megabit cir circuit um, to make a business case. And that's, that's a lot for customers to pay. That may not even lead to adoption. It's really hard for us to stomach putting so much public funding into a network if the service provider is forced to still charge really high monthly costs. Um, so many states have recognized this problem and have started investing in what's known as an open access middle mile network. Arizona is one that has really paved the way here. They've invested hundreds of millions of dollars toward this effort. Alabama just um, a few months ago announced, I think, $84 million in state funding to a middle mile network. So the difference between a traditional middle mile and open access is that open access networks allow any service provider to connect to middle mile infrastructure at a wholesale rate that every other provider is charged. So you're driving down the access fees for middle mile infrastructure through that model um, to enable more providers to enter previously unserved markets. It can eliminate 90 to 95% of the transport costs. So it fundamentally changes the economics of deploying broadband networks across the state in unserved and underserved areas. And this is important to our office because our mission is um, affordable universal access. And this not only drives down the cost for the end consumer, which leads to greater adoption or more people subscribing to the service, but it also encourages competition, which increases service levels and further lowers cost. Um, so we don't, although we don't have money at um, the state for that purpose. We did identify, as Corey talked about, um, a federal grant program for middle mile infrastructure, um, something called the Enabling Middle Mile Broadband Infrastructure Program. It's done through a branch of the Federal Department of Commerce called the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. And it's a $1 billion allocation out of the Infrastructure Act um, 
So we applied for a grant in um, conjunction with a couple government agencies, including KDOT, who has been such a wonderful partner. And um, that program we'll hear about in May. It was 550% oversubscribed, but we feel like we have a really compelling case. KDOT has um, stepped up to, I said, to work with the private sector to allow for co-location, which drastically drives down costs for both sides. I really appreciated your question, Representative Delperding. I know a lot of other states have learned how to monetize those um, assets in state right-of-ways. And so we just need to work on a model that um, protects our interests while um, advancing those um, of the public's in those underserved areas. I also wanted to um, point out that in addition to KDOT, CANREN, if you're not familiar with that agency, it's the Kansas uh, Research and Education Network. There's a, a REN or a Research and Education Network in pretty much every state. And it's uh, sometimes a consortium that's a nonprofit, sometimes it's, it's governmental, but it basically provides uh, dedicated fiber service to universities. And this is really um, important because universities have a much higher need for bandwidth and and broadband than um, a typical end user would, almost like a small community. And Kansas is one of only five states that doesn't have a dedicated fiber network to its universities. Um, and so they're, they're forced to lease um, at high costs and they can't scale up as needed. Um, and when you're thinking of trying to get research grant dollars into the state um, and just other needs, uh, for instance, I think it was Emporia that had a fire uh, several years back and they were down for you know several days because they, uh, you know, didn't have that resilient, dedicated fiber network. So uh, Canron has been working on um, trying to remedy that and, and trying to get state funding for dark fiber, dedicated dark fiber. This grant that we applied for would include um, building out some of those universities. Um, we already talked about how this would benefit um, residents and, to a certain, and also businesses. Of course, we at Commerce, that's kind of our primary interest. Um, we really think that bringing... Um, Bringing that connectivity allows rural areas to be competitive in the global market and allows for greater competitive remote areas of work, bringing people back to Kansas. Um, agriculture is obviously our largest sector, and um, we worked with Kelsey Olson over there on this grant to gain her insight into what are the needs of our farmers in these more rural areas. And can, precision agriculture is, is, is driven so largely by technology today and um, we're, we're really missing out on efficiencies in, um, in Kansas ag and, and the ability to, like for instance, um, lower our water usage, get higher yields, um, all of that can come with increased connectivity. Um, we also have benefits to um, our emergency management system. Uh, if, if you're familiar with Jason Bryant, the statewide interoperability coordinator, he's really passionate about his work and trying to increase uh, ways to make sure that um, um, our first responders have the latest technology. Right now it's on uh, most, of, most of their gear is on uh, waves, like radio waves, microwaves, and we would be able to, um, or bringing fiber, the more fiber we drive out into those rural areas, uh, the greater capacity we can provide to them. Um, so I feel like I'm just going on and on. I think I'm going to leave it at that and um, would love to stand for any questions you have. Does anybody have any questions? Representative Delperdang. Thank you for being here. Um, specific on the CanRen network, I thought they own some of their own private fiber. They do. They, um, we, they have about, they have all the regent universities and a few community colleges and they do have dedicated fiber on certain legs. They're just trying to build it out um, as a, you know, the entire network. And it, you know, would probably take them several decades to do on their own. It, it, then it goes off to other research institutes and so forth. Right? Exactly. Aren't, are they running IPv4 on that now? Or I am not sure. It, it was a little bit different from the norm. but Yeah, I could ask. I know that they recently had a, um, they, they have a new director, an interim director, with the um, departure of, of Court Buffington, so, but I'd be happy to get that information for yeah, you. Just be curious. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? So I have one. Where, where are the IXPs that are located in Kansas right now? Yeah, so Kansas is one of 17 states that currently does not have an IXP or a carrier neutral internet exchange point. I believe we did include one of those in our application as well. And um, the representative from Connected Nation can, can certainly speak 
better on this than I can, but IXPs play a critical role in providing more efficient and cost-effective interconnection um, because the alternative is transiting that traffic through a third party to be exchanged and then delivered back to the terminating network. So right now, our providers are going through, um, you know, Kansas City, at a Leno 2 Grand Kansas City, Missouri, or Omaha or Oklahoma City, maybe Denver. Um, so one of the things I, I know, I don't understand much about this, but if you get middle mile fiber from, do we have middle mile fiber that's got open access from Kansas City to Wichita? Um, I am not aware of any open access networks in Kansas. We do have middle mile networks. It's just that these networks can choose whether or not they allow someone to interconnect and they can also choose the rates, which may be exorbitant. Um, but we also know that they have, we have a couple decades of empirical evidence that shows they're, they're not really interested in going into these unserved communities. So if you get your grant from the federal government, will there be open access internet, middle mile internet fiber available? Yes, that is the goal. And the great thing about open access is that everyone has the same opportunity to connect to it um, at fair rates um, and low rates. And we designed the application to not only allow for um, interconnection at the lit service level, but at all three levels of the stack. So conduit, if you have a large provider that has the wherewithal to, you know, um, draw their own fiber through through a conduit, they can do that. They can access just the conduit layer. We also have the dark fiber layer, um, and we have a lit services layer. So all providers would have equal access to all three of those, and we would have a neutral um, nonprofit person um, managing that. Um, you know, how Corey was saying, we're, we're having a little bit of trouble figuring out this leasing thing. Well, that's not, that's not their main um, gig over there, right? So we would uh, actually work with Connected Nation. What we did when we um, convened this group of agencies interested in this um, submitting an application is we had KDOT issue an RFP for interested private parties. Um, and they built their RFP around the primary freight routes that they would like to build out in the next several years, thinking we could leverage federal funds instead of only using state funds to build those out. And then we um, kind of spoke to all, or we didn't, but the providers who submitted their um, proposals spoke out a network that also included other priorities, which were listed in the RFP, which is, you know, regents, universities, any kind of emergency management, um, any kind of I think national defense we had on there. So um, the priorities I've kind of talked about hitting rural networks. And then we, um, we received four proposals and there was an executive committee that graded those and selected um, a partnership between Connected Nation as a third party administrator and IdeaTech as the primary um, deployment agent, the, the construction piece of it. That's kind of how that process went. So, so let's say you get your grant. Mm -hmm. Where will the IXPs be located at in Kansas? So we had, I believe, one IXP in the grant application, which is we have located in Wichita because it's the middle of the state. There, uh, Connected Nation is also working on additional proposals to locate IXPs. Um, I believe one in Hayes, and 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 Tom can talk about others. We, um, I do want to mention that the application would just be a start. Um, I provided a map of where the network uh, design of what the network design kind of looks for. And again, this was based off of KDOT's primary freight routes, but we were also trying to keep the cost or the ask down to a certain level because to build out a, a comprehensive statewide network would probably be half a billion dollars. And we knew that there was only a billion dollars for the entire nation. So we're trying to keep our ask under 75. I think I have in there that it's 43, but I believe our ask was actually 73. So this would just be a start. I look at this build out map that you have. Now, the closest IXP right now is in Kansas City, Missouri. We're I mean, maybe I, I don't understand this. Do you have to connect to another IXP to have an IXP or do you connect with the internet somehow else? Well, so um, yeah, Tom, Tom is better versed on this, but I, I think if you, wanna, if you wanna have an IXP, it needs to be in an area where traffic naturally aggregates and where providers from that core backbone will choose to co-locate. 
Um, and even though Kansas City is the closest provider or closest ISP to, you know, part of Kansas, I would say Denver may be closer to those on the western side of the state. Um, so, yeah. Did he just leave? Was that Tom? No. Okay. No, I was like, no. Please don't tell me he went because I can't answer that any better. <laughs> So how do you get from how do you get to that IXP in Wichita? I mean, what's the plan? How how will where will it connect to to get the IXP speed? I know I'm not understanding something here, but well, yeah, I I will defer to Tom on that question. How they plan to construct that and bring um, international traffic and and tier one providers into into that location. Representative Ballard. Thank you. I was following that. I think I have a similar question. But what if you don't get the grant? Well, what do we yeah. do then? Because it is still needed in the rural area. Yeah. You still have the the first leg, the last leg maybe, and in, in the middle is where it is. But what what can be done? I mean, is it something the state needs to chip into in order to make this possible? Because it is a state problem, not just a rural problem. It absolutely is. Thank you, Representative, for that question. Um, I would, yeah, I would encourage the state to um, explore ways to fund it. Pardon me. <coughs> I feel like I can't cough because you know everyone thinks I have the plague now. You can, can't have allergies or anything. Anyway, um, I digress. So um, it is my firm belief that we were we will not get to universal connectivity without a robust middle mile open access network. So we'll need to figure it out somehow. Um, I'm hopeful we've been trying to work with our congressional delegation for additional support and our partners at the NTIA, but I also recognize, you know, there is um, not a lot of money dedicated to this. We're also working with our congressional delegation to educate them on why more money, or Congress should allocate more money to the middle mile program and that last mile programs, while very um, important, um, don't always get at the the high cost or the adoption, it's not enough to just have that infrastructure to people. If they can't afford it, what good is it doing in driving um, more people into the digital economy um, or improving communities or uplifting lives? So we really um, are trying to get Congress to, to see that and allocate more money. But I do think it would be wise of us, like many, many states, to look at what we need to do and in, to invest in our own network. Go ahead. When I listen to you, I think in terms of what we had to do with telecom and what we end up having to do with cell phones in rural areas and infrastructure and all of that. And it was that universal fund that we have today, even on our cell phone bills and everything else that's probably pretty close to 20 years now. Yeah. Is that what you say similar to what it is broadband would need, but I know broadband would need more, but we had to actively <laughs> as a state start to participate in that. Yes, that's a, that's a, a great question. And, and yeah, we would, we would similarly need some sort of fund. I, not sure I would be in favor of um, putting another fee on an end user service to to fund a middle mile network because the, the reason we want a middle mile network is, is to drive down those costs for the end user. Um, but we would need some revenue source. And um, speaking of the universal service fund, it was very effective in getting um, telephone service out to those networks. And those networks are, the, the providers in, in those networks that get universal service fund fees are, um, you know, very committed to their local communities and have been there 50, 100 years, and they, they're they looking at the long game. Many of them have built fiber optic networks with um, kind of leveraging those funds, and many of them also belong to a consortium that has a middle mile network where they leverage that to, um, you know, help each other out, but it's not, um, it's not an open access network. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Next on the agenda is Thomas Garrett. He's the Director of Business Development with Idea Tech. Welcome to the committee, Thomas. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> appreciate you letting me come up and talk to you. Thanks very much for inviting me up here to talk. I met um, Chairman Francis and was giving him some information on 
the problem and what we're trying to do to fix it. And he said, hey, would you come up and talk about it? So that's what I'm doing. Uh, Jay did a really good job. So a lot of what's in here will just be duplicative. So I think I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is just try and talk a little bit about who we are and what we've done um, to be involved in this effort so far and then just field some questions. So um, IdeaTech uh, is a fiber internet. We're a last mile fiber internet provider, ISP. Um, we spent some time um, previously as a, a middle mile um, uh, carrier network provider. So we were building long haul networks to provide connectivity for cell towers and uh, things like that. We built about 4,500 miles of fiber in the state of Kansas. Um, and then that network that we had built um, was actually sold to a larger company called Zayo Group out of, uh, they're a uh, national company based out of Denver, international company based out of Denver. And so now we focus mainly on those last mile networks, fiber to the home, fiber to the business. And we operate about 50 communities um, in Kansas today and uh, participate in a lot of the programs that Jade was mentioning. We participate in CPF here recently and uh, got a grant to build some last mile in high cost areas in Western Kansas. Um, but specifically, you know, how does middle mile availability affect a provider like us? I mean, it's, it's exactly what was communicated, you know, and I kind of draw it, you know, I do to try and draw it with a metaphor. It's like, hey, you can, if you imagine all the communities in Kansas and, um, you know, the roads that exist that connect those communities, if they didn't exist, you had to move, you know, with covered wagon from town to town. The goods and services cost to the consumer is expensive because it's very expensive to get the things you need where they need to go. And then, you know, if you imagine, okay, one step back, we built the roads, but one or two people are able to monetize and restrict and use those roads to restrict traffic. The, the goods and services came down some, they didn't come down much. If you open up access to those roads through the state, which is through open access, uh, middle mile that allows, you know, multiple data freight carriers to move through the state on those roads, um, you're going to lower the goods and services to the customer significantly. And so that's what, you know, the point of trying to expand uh, middle mile and create um, an open access environment where multiple providers can use that infrastructure. It's really going to drive the price down. Um, we're very comfortable in a competitive market. You know, Jade talked about some of the expense to the customer. For us, you know, we've been advocating for a long time that the acceptable level of broadband at 25.3 was was not adequate and needed to be bumped up. And so, you know, 100 meg symmetrical is, is kind of the new, you know, good definition of good broadband. We looked at our service offerings here a while ago and realized, hey, if that's what we are saying good looks like, that's what we should provide. So on our fiber networks, the lowest available service is 100 meg symmetrical. It's 50 bucks a month. You know, it's th that's, and, and how do you get that? How do you allow providers like, us, that, which of which there's many in the state, there's other providers that do a great job and offer services like we do. How do you get them to expand in these communities, offering them the roads to get their goods and services to those other communities? It's really going to make a big difference. So that's just kind of my piece on, you know, the need. Um, what have we done um, to kind of help bring legitimacy to um, what Jade's talking about? So we partnered uh, with KDOT. Um, through uh, just we had a project to try and bring connectivity to some schools uh, in Sedgwick County as a school district looking for services northeast of Wichita and so we were looking at the business case which you know everything we do relies on a business case it has to meet an ROI and be sustainable so we're looking at the business case we're having some difficulties trying to understand okay how are we going to get connectivity through um, this is a spread out it's a rural school district so it's you know, in four different um, town locations over a 30 mile stretch. And we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we get those fiber connections to give them the scalable infrastructure they need and build the infrastructure for what we can, uh, you know, make sense out of. And so uh, I had been made aware of Mike Floberg, who uh, has departed at KDOT, but was um, somebody I reached out to to say, hey, Mike, you know, I've kind of heard that you guys are 
doing fiber work? Do you have any fiber? Is there anything we can do? I described the project to him and he said, hey, we have an objective to build fiber down the side of the 254 corridor, which is directionally that, you know, that way. So I said, hey, can we partner, work together, put the infrastructure in the ground at the same time? We saved about 30% of the cost for each side. So it's a great benefit, 30% of you know, taxpayers' costs for something that they had already um, thought about doing. And it gave us a business case to go build that infrastructure. So when we built that infrastructure, we put um, two, the, two pieces of infrastructure in the ground at the same time. So a conduit for us and a conduit for KDOT. Each of us have fiber in those separate conduits. Ultimately, if you can enact what is being proposed in this grant, which is you put a pack of conduits in the ground at one time, and then those conduits are shared by providers, you bring that cost down even more. You leverage each other's ability to um, deploy and use you know, the business case that you have to do so. So um, it was really effective. It's a great way to partner. We're digging once. We're safe in the right of way one time. We're not disturbing the right of way multiple times. I, I appreciate the question of you know, access after the fact. That's a challenge. And so that's one of the things that, like for us, we put two infrastructures that we each own separately and we permit our own infrastructure so we have access to it in the right way as a provider. That's very clear. That's how, you know, it's usually done. So it's, it's acceptable when you put both those infrastructures in the ground together and now multiple providers may have to get at that infrastructure. That's when you end up with challenges like you uh, alluded to. And the, what we tried to do, so we responded to the RFP uh, with a proposal for infrastructure for the federal program. And um, one of the things we were trying to address was, okay, we're a private provider, we're for profit. We don't, like this is open access. Somebody needs to administer and solve for those concerns and those challenges. Connected Nation was brought to the table. We were aware, hey, this is a neutral, not, not for profit entity that is working on expanding internet exchange point access in Kansas maybe they would have an interest in operating this open access middle mile and administering access so that there was a process for folks to solve for that problem after the fact. So they were, we, we brought them and said, hey, why don't we get together? We talked to the state, we submitted something for the RFP. And that is, it's a collective partnership with um, multiple entities adding value from different perspectives. But we were hoping to address concerns like that so that there's actually, you know, there is a scalable solution. There's a middle mile infrastructure that's open access. It has somebody administering access. Anybody can benefit from that. Any provider um, that wants to benefit on any layer of that infrastructure that Jade mentioned um, would have the ability to do so. So it's a really good way to solve the problem from, from a provider's perspective. Um, I see it as a, you know, it's an innovation. And one thing I do have in here I wanted to get out was you know, I have the opportunity to travel and, and talk to providers like us in other states and go to conferences in other parts of the country. And when I talk about the level of partnership that we've received from the Kansas Department of Transportation, a state entity, I'm usually met with shock that we could have somebody so forward thinking that's willing to partner and look at ways to leverage the work effort and the taxpayers' dollars to to produce something that benefits for folks that are trying to do what we do. So I just wanted to get that out there and say, hey, what we're doing is right. Um, and to the point of um, what do we do if we don't get the grant? You know, Jay's working on the problem. As she said, we're working on this problem all the time. There's going to be ways to, um, to get it done. I think the important thing to communicate here is, hey, this application's out there today advocating that it get done, what, what it does do is it, it accelerates the ability to solve the problem. Like you can solve it now instead of waiting to see what we can do about it in the future. Could, could we put some a state program together? Yeah, we could. It might be two years down the road before that comes together and you can do something. Right now, there's a federal grant opportunity. Hey, let, let's get behind it and, and try and get it done. And then we don't have to think about that. So, so that's kind of my piece. Um, happy to uh, answer any questions. I'm not very good in open forum, so if any of you guys have questions afterwards, I'm you know I'm always available. So, Representative Neely, 
Uh, I have two questions. One, you've been working on this for quite some time, haven't you? Uh, in here? In, in, yeah. And, and uh, uh, you've been thinking about this, and I say this because I believe you and I spoke about this two years ago. Your voice sounds very familiar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and my second question is, where are you based out of? Yeah. Uh, the provider? The, actually, the city. The, so Beulah, Beulah, Kansas. Yep. That's where uh, Idea Tech's based out of. And okay. So it's right next to Hutchinson. That's what I, that's what I thought. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Representative Minix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thomas, I'm trying to tie a couple of things together here. Mm -hmm. KDOT does the Highway 83 corridor, and, and they're basically tying an area that you've already developed somewhat to the south of that. Uh, you came into Meade County? Yeah. I think back across, and it, uh, it's evident to me that Northwest Kansas has uh, a very vibrant fiber optic network up there, and yet the corridor on Highway 83 going up has been lacking. There was nothing that tied Garden City to Oakley. Elkater didn't have cable service, obviously. Are, are you, once this cable is put in by KDOT, do you have plans to uh, do the final mile along that area? Yeah, absolutely. So we're always looking to build last mile off of available middle mile. And, and, and you know, one of the things that access to those uh, new locations and, I mean, specifically... Uh, where would where are we looking to expand? I mean, I guess I'll I'll try and answer the question without, you know, there's a little bit of nuance associated with what I would like to say in open forum about where our plans are to expand. But we're we're going to spend a hundred million dollars over the next three years on on fiber to the home expansion. So anywhere that we have access to get our traffic that we need to get to that uh, place to offer our goods and services. You know, it's it's our it's to our benefit to expand there. So yeah, absolutely, it's our intent to build off of that middle mile and and serve folks in Kansas. Yep. Other questions? So, Thomas, again, back to my question to Jade. So we get an IXP in Wichita. Does that tie into another IXP some way, or do you get your service like through a satellite or? Yes. So, like I mean, or... imagine, you know, fiber goes everywhere. I mean, that's that's the every, you know, we talk about, hey, what's the solution? People ask about, you know, if you get one of these, does that solve the problem of, of you know, home Internet anymore? Is this going to be the solution long term in the future? I mean, this connects to the nearest tower, which goes straight into the ground, to the nearest piece of fiber, which goes to a middle mile network, which, which goes to. An, ISP, an, an IXP location somewhere, um, which goes from that IXP location out, right, to the broader internet. So all technology relies on the underlying infrastructure that we're talking about. Where does, uh, like, 1102 Grand go? There's fiber infrastructure that leaves Kansas City Metro and goes to other states and other IXPs, and then from those it goes, you know, under the sea to other countries. I mean, the data is is moved through fiber uh, as, you know, and, and so if you imagine like, okay, what is, a, what is an IXP going to do for me? It's every point getting the edge of the network or the, the aggregation point of the network closer to the consumer every time. So every time you add an aggregation point closer to the consumer, you know, that's where the networks, the last mile networks are going to converge. So, if you think about, and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but if you think about the number of devices connecting to the internet today, you have fridges, thermostats, doorbells, like all these things that rely on the internet. The number of devices connecting to the internet is growing at a rate none of us can comprehend. And so bringing that edge of network closer to the consumer is going to become more and more important as that you know, generally larger network exists. So to the point of like, okay, what does it do for you? You have an IXP in Kansas City, Missouri. What's the next step? Well, having availability of fiber middle mile that can get traffic from 1102 Grand to 
Wichita, a place in IXP at Wichita that's neutral, that allows carriers to come to, that will encourage competition in the market, will encourage more people to come and drive those prices down. That's the next step of getting aggregation closer to the consumer. Then, you know, Pittsburgh, um, Hayes, uh, Liberal, Godsey, wherever the next level of aggregation gets to, you're always trying to get that aggregation of, of um, network or providers to converge closer to the consumer. And, you know, that's going to reduce the price. So the, I, I guess to the answer to the question is, you know, you, I think it's beneficial to get an IXP looking at what we need today, getting something that's neutral in, in Wichita makes a lot of sense. And then further beyond that, those are going to be needed as more devices come available in all these different points and, and communities or uh, centers where there's economic growth and there's more devices and there's more people. Like you need to constantly work on that getting that aggregation closer to um, to the end user. So I could see Wichita. Wichita makes significant logical sense. The fact that, you know, there's kind of two objectives here. One is to get an IXP in Wichita. The other is to build a digital road that allows for multiple providers to move traffic from 1102 Grand to that IXP, thus making it inexpensive for people to peer in that IXP because they can connect to the next level of aggregation or IXP. Like it's a huge benefit to have both of those things working together because you're solving uh, all of the, for all of the problems that you have, which is trying to get more aggregation points and more uh, roads and traffic and availability to move uh, traffic to those aggregation points. Yeah. So I, I mean, my analogy that I'm seeing is that all of you guys that are providing fiber to um, um, my house, for instance, your, the analogy would be you're taking a dirt road, uh, a dirt road turnpike to get to the IXP. And so I think for the IXP to be in Wichita, we need to build a free interstate instead of an expensive turnpike. Right. And my question is the turnpike, um, Interchange is going to be in Wichita. Where is it going to tie into the existing, or excuse me, the interstate interchange is in Wichita. Where is it going to tie into the other IXP? Is it going to tie into an IXP in Kansas City, or is it going to tie into an IXP in Oklahoma City? So or it will. So what the way that we in the grant? Yeah. So where the way that we designed the infrastructure to build uh, in Wichita is, hey, we, we know where the IXP is, is, is intentionally going to be located. So what we did was design an infrastructure that cross-sections Wichita in two directions uh, with multiple conduit paths that go, you know, in a, in a cross-section across Wichita. The reason for that is, you know, the IXP is, is most effective if infrastructure can get to it. If it can get connected to as many places as possible, that's what most benefits it from a, from a data connectivity. So if you provide a path that cross sections Wichita and then allows it basically, if you imagine all the different infrastructures that come from every other carrier network that's, that's going through Wichita, you essentially cross all those networks and provide a path for somebody to get to that IXP somewhere where their network crosses that cross section. And so somebody who has a network that goes, um, you know, north and south up um, 135, for instance, there's a conduit path that crosses 135 and goes to the IXP. So if they want to get to that IXP, now they have a path from their current infrastructure to that IXP. If they're going east and west on 54 and Kellogg, they have a path that goes from 54 to that IXP, they can get their network to that. What that would encourage is now that in an exchange point isn't just going to connect to Kansas City, Missouri. It's going to connect to Dallas. It's going to connect to Denver. It's going to connect to everywhere that internet networks are going to come from. And so the hope is it connects everywhere. And then traffic can come from all over the country and get to that IXP and then be distributed from that IXP to last mile networks. 
So, and those same last mile networks. So this one of the things that's a little hard to grasp is in some instances, that same network that gets it there might be the same network that takes it away, you know, uh, to another aggregation point. So, you know, fiber is really tricky to wrap your head around because there's so much capacity in that single cable. But if, as long as you can cross the path of the fiber and get an available path to the IXP, you're going to exponentially improve the, the connectivity problem. But we don't have to build that available path. The other carriers will provide that available path. The available path to like Dallas or something. Right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's paths going, there's multiple providers providing traffic today to 1102 grand from Dallas, Denver, you know, uh, Nebraska, anywhere that, that traffic needs to go. There's multiple providers that, that converge in 1102 grand. We're building a path from 1102. We, would propose to build a path from 1102 Grand to Wichita solves that problem. The hope too is that the providers that have networks that are traversing Kansas would also provide direct paths from Dallas, Denver to Wichita as well. Just looked like the path that you built or that I saw in Jade's thing. It went all the way down to, was it Fort Scott or Pittsburgh? And then it went over to Wichita. Yep. Okay. So your path to get to, Kansas City goes to Pittsburgh, and then it goes up to Kansas City. That's all I was trying to ask. Hey, Representative Collins. Uh, I was just going to mention that, uh, and I think it's part of what you're saying, that, you know, multiple paths from different directions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that always happens. <laughs> but multiple paths from different directions is good because that way if uh, – there's an outage or something that can come in from a different way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. That's a, you know, that's a huge deal too. You want resilient networks. Um, again, today we rely on a, on mo for the most part, if you ask everybody where they go, uh, where they peer to, it's 1102 grand, Kansas City, Missouri. And so that's, you know, your kind of single point of failure, so to speak, for smaller carriers. Um, and then you're looking for a path to another, uh, another, uh, like Dallas Stemmons or something. Well, in a previous life, I've worked in this a little bit. But, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for use of the microphone. Any other questions? Oh, Representative Delperdang. Thank you. Um, so today, how how are you truly getting to 11, uh, to, to Graham? I mean, you have a Pretty expensive connection today. So you're leasing it from another carrier. Yeah. Then. Okay. And depending upon that carrier today, if you're hitting in like Wichita, I'm assuming, is that where you're picking up the carrier? Um, there should be existing paths where they go, I believe, out of Wichita, primarily to Dallas. I think the one in, at Grand Street actually shoots up to Chicago. Uh, yeah, so, and South Canal, if I believe, in order to get onto the backbones. Yeah. So one thing I'll say is, I, once it gets past the point of aggregation, I understand it's really hard to know where the network goes. I mean, that's one of the challenges that you know you face as a provider buying connectivity from another provider in in one of these locations. Um, that today doesn't have, you know, an available open access middle mile or somewhere you don't know how the connection's getting there. You rely on said provider to give you a connection that's going to be redundant, that's going to stay up. Um, you know, I don't want to mention any names because I don't, I don't want to, you know, say that, but those providers we have, we pay a lot of money for connections um, that for us. Um, so we went, what outlines our commitment to a customer when we sell them connectivity is the service level agreement. So we have a service level agreement that says, hey, you're going to get service at um, X amount of dollars. If it goes down for this long, you're going to get this many dollars back on you know, that thing going down. It, the, to, to agree to that service level agreement, you have an upstream provider that has a service level agreement also. Um, you know, we, we rely on the commitment of those providers for it to 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 be resilient, we don't know where the network goes from that point. So, I mean, to the point, I think, you know, I'm maybe rambling a little bit. I'd love to have a deeper conversation about it, um, but there are paths, they're expensive, and um, you, 
you know, you, you don't know what's there and what isn't past the aggregation point. We understand. Is your your goal is to get it? Is it eleven oh two grand? Is that the address? Yeah, your goal is to get there. And my understanding is that that's to carry your hotel. That ain't yeah. really an ISP backbone center. I think it's a hotel. Yeah, and so that's probably something that Tom can speak to a little bit. Is you know the IXP specifically, and you know eleven oh two grand, and and what it is, and how you know those other uh, IXPs would would exist and operate. Yeah, so I don't want to dive any deeper. Yeah. Transportation committee, but it's yeah, just intrigued. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think I've already put on sleep. <laughs> right. Any other question? Oh, Representative Goddard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We talked about a lot of wonderful things that we can do with the internet and communication and all this kind. Of, I can check my security cameras from my cell phone here in Topeka, even though they're 150 miles away. This is probably a question that uh, is very unlikely to happen, but how hardened is our systems, are our systems against the electromagnetic pulse, EMP? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll defer a little bit because I'm definitely not like the tech guy, but one thing I can say that, that um, you know, resilient networks that have multiple feeds, that's how you solve that problem. And what's going to what how how's your network going to be affected by that? It's it's where the electronics sit. Fiber isn't going to be affected. That's why one of the things why fiber is such an amazing technology is, you know, heat, um, weather, uh, electric. Like you don't get affected on the physical infrastructure level, only at the aggregation level. And so if you have, you know, redundant aggregation levels where the electronics sit. Your network's very strong, so. Well, EMP could render this thing unusable. Yes. It could render your vehicle un, uh, unusable uh, yeah. to drive. So um, it's the, the internet and the fiber are wonderful, but they don't have anything to serve. You know, we're out in the wind. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thanks Thank for coming. You. Thank you very much. Today. Appreciate it. And now we're going to have a presentation by formal, former state representative Tom Cox, who has went to the dark side Thank or dark you, fiber. Well, I guess you went to the dark fiber, maybe. That's a good way to put it. Um, is it easier for you guys to pull up my PowerPoint or for me to connect in? Uh, you can do it. It's not many slides. Um, yes, uh, and it's fun. This is the first time I've actually testified since I was a former state rep here um, in front of a committee. And as Representative Hoheisel can attest, I was always on time to transportation, House Transportation Committee when I served on it last. Um, and if he says anything different, please ignore him because he's right. Um, are you, you pulling it up on your end? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, you've already started diving into a lot of what I was going to talk to you today about, which is the other piece of middle mile and internet infrastructure, internet exchange points, as we call them, IXPs. Um, my name is Tom Cox. I'm the Vice President of State Government Affairs. Uh, we are a, you can go to the next slide. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit out of, based out of Kentucky um, that has worked exclusively in the broadband space since 2001. Um, we do programmatic work in, this says 13 states, but we, now it's, uh, up to about 15 as of this week with, uh, closing a few more contracts, helping states deal with, uh, their GIS broadband mapping. So we do a lot of data validation where carriers submit their information. The state wants to validate it to look at served and unserved areas. And then we go out and do our, their, the validation and GIS mapping for them to confirm. Um, additionally, we're doing a considerable amount of work in with this Infrastructure and Jobs Act. You have to, um, there's two pots of funding mostly. BEAD, which is what a lot of you're going to hear about the last mile infrastructure projects, a little bit of middle mile, and then DEA, digital equity. Um, and so they have to put five year plans forth to NTIA to get that money. And so we are consulting with quite a few states on helping them uh, construct those programs. Additionally, we do a lot of grant administration, like the, uh, I think the state of Michigan said, we've got this $10 million grant, uh, we don't have the resources, here's the guidelines. And so we are administering that, reviewing all the applications, and then kind of putting the final recommendations of here's how you should spend that money, here's the qualified applicants. Um, 
And then we are very big in advocacy on internet exchange points, as well as trying to work to create a resilient network of carrier neutral internet exchange points uh, throughout the nation in tier two and tier three markets, which are usually skipped over with these. Um, so uh, go to the next slide, please. The biggest thing is kind of, we've already been talking about what is an internet exchange point. Um, it's a physical location through which the internet infrastructure companies connect with each other. Uh, it's literally a physical building that they connect to, into. Um, the major people who are connecting to these are internet providers, um, ISPs, content delivery networks. Think your Netflix, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, um, booking.com, all the major financial institutions, all these places that have their own internal systems that are delivering content to you through the internet. Um, and then long haul fiber tier one providers, uh, think of that more in what um, Jade talked about with your first mile. These are the people that are out there running uh, the highway system. And so I was kind of thinking as the, the previous presenters were presenting, trying to break this down into analogies, because that's how my brain thinks. So I'm gonna give you two different analogies kind of about how the system, how I envision it. Um, one is, so you've got your first mile networks out there. They're really like your interstate, interstate system running throughout the nation. They're connecting every state, major cities, smaller cities, but they don't connect everything. But that's where the bulk of your traffic throughout the United States is running to connect to. Then you have middle mile. That's your state highway system. So you've got these major networks running, and then you've got these middle mile networks breaking off of them to serve those areas that are not currently being served by that, um, by the interstate. So that's, I mean, Representative Francis, you can attest to is you have... I think one of the two, actually, and I think Representative Minix, did you have the two longest drives to the Capitol? Um, you have to go on a lot of state highways and then connect to an interstate, and then it gets a little bit faster. If there was an interstate directly from your house to the Capitol, your drive would probably be hour, two hours shorter. Um, and then off of this, you have last mile. Last mile are your uh, streets. They're the things that are not the highway system. They're the streets throughout your city. And why this is, and then the IXP is what you can think of as kind of your interchanges, exits, on ramps, off ramps. It's a physical location where all of these people can interconnect to each other. So from a traffic perspective, but that's also the rest stop. It's where you can get gas. It's where you can get you know um, the the content, the things you need as well to fill up. So it's it's that point that physically connects all of these together and allows them to then spin off onto each other. Um, you can also think of it the same way you think of the utility grid. So um, your long haul system is transmission lines. You can build a power plant that produces a lot of power and you can build a city with the most advanced state of the art um, power lines that you'd ever think. But if you don't have transmission lines to connect to the two, that power is not going anywhere. Your homes are still unpowered no, long, no matter how much you invest in your power, power lines or last mile if you can't connect to the transmission lines and then get access to the system, it's all for naught. Same way, you can build the best streets in the world and have this gorgeous city, but if it's 400 miles from the closest interstate, you're probably gonna have a really, really long drive in between. Versus if the interstate runs right to your city or highway runs straight to your city connecting, it, it speeds everything up. So the internet's really working this exact same way. The third and last analogy I'll give you on this is the internet actually still works exactly like the old uh, phone switchboards that we're all used to seeing, where the operator is pulling the pin and plugging it in. The internet is that fundamentally that exact same system, except it's all automated and it happens at internet exchange points. So that's where your ha traffic hands off. If you, uh, Representative Hohiles, will send an email to me and you're on Cox Communication and you send that to me and I'm on Google Fiber, that it still ha they have to go somewhere to talk to each other to hand off that traffic to me. That point is going to be an internet exchange point somewhere. So why this is important, and if you'd like to go to the next slide, is because the further, wait, uh, wait, one more slide. No, let me see. Did I mess up mine? <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, I think it's the, I don't know if the order on there is different, but one back. Uh, yes, okay. So this kind of helped just a basic visualization of how they connect to each other. And then, yeah, I, I will go to the next slide, I apologize. Um, this is actually a map of all the internet exchanges in the US, or internet exchange points in the US. Um, and not all of them are created equal, and I'll get into that in a second, but 
the further you are physically on the internet from an internet exchange point or from further from an internet exchange point, the farther your traffic has to go to connect and deliver out. So if you're, as you can see, Kansas does not have one in its boundaries. We do have one in downtown Kansas City, Missouri, or we don't have one, they have one. Um, and it's a, a very major one in the U.S. It is one of the larger ones in the U.S., which is good regionally, um, but that doesn't really help you much if you're in liberal Kansas. Um, you have one in Denver. Um, you have one in Oklahoma City, but it is very small. Um, additionally, it matters. These are all not inherently connected to each other. They have to have people running and connecting them. Is that what really matters? So if we're all running to Kansas City and Kansas City goes down, it's not like you can say, okay, just route it over to St. Louis or route it down to Dallas. They have to have that direct connection because you may be like, okay, well, Dallas is closer to us, so reconnect there. But if you don't have a direct connection, that might be three times as far running across the internet as Chicago is. So that's why I talk about they're not all inherently equal because um, it's not a perfect grid. It's like the utility system. If, if you're, we're in the Southwest Power Pool, if Kansas goes down, we can draw power from anyone else in the Southwest Power Pool. Um, but if the whole Southwest Power Pool goes out, we don't really have great connectivity to the whole rest of the United States, and so we're in trouble. Um, internet very much works along those the same guidelines. But what are the benefits of an internet exchange point? Um, people talked about earlier that one of them is your long-haul transit costs. So ISPs, um, like IdeaTech, they have to buy long-haul transit. So if they don't have direct connection to there, they have to go buy it from someone else who does have that. The longer the transit, the higher the cost. Um, this is actually a very, very big deal for rural Kansas, but especially the western half, which is buying a lot of very long, long-haul transit. So you can have Google Fiber, or not Google, you can have fiber uh, internet, and you can have, they could say, we could provide up to 10 gig speed, but it's going to take us 400 miles to connect to an ISP that we have to, ISP that we have to um, buy long haul transit on. And through that long haul transit, the cost is going to go up so much that you may be paying $150 um, a month and it may not be able to handle, they may not allocate out 10 gigs. So you may still be at a hundred megabytes. Um, so having that connectivity point matters for driving down costs. Additionally, um, it's keeping your internet local. So we talked about having content delivery networks in there. So if you're down in Wichita and you want to watch Netflix, almost guaranteed that you're probably connecting up into Kansas City. So every time you're streaming, it's going from Kansas City to 1102 Grand, which they have a rack space, the server space in there for Netflix. Netflix is in that building. And so they have local cached content and then that comes back to you. You're still your internet still going that whole distance versus if you had one in Wichita, your traffic is, and then you have um, Netflix locally um, as a part of that IXP, all your traffic stays local, never leaves the region. This makes a really big deal for latency. And latency hasn't been a huge deal for us in the future or in the past. We've just been excited to get this faster and faster speeds. But when you start talking about autonomous vehicles, you start talking about surgeries that are being done by robots. Um, 15 millisecond latency doesn't seem like a big deal. If I have a robot moving something inside my organs, it needs one millisecond or less latency. And that's the difference between a successful surgery and death. Um, not necessarily, but it's that latency is a really, really big deal. And the direction our technology is going, augmented reality, virtual reality. I mean, latency is going to be the thing in the internet you're hearing is this is the biggest constraint we have in moving technology forward. It's not going to be bandwidth. It's not going to be speeds. It's going to be latency issues. And latency is determined how far do you have to connect out to those content providers. Um, so I talked a little bit about how not all um, IXPs are created equal. Um, part of it is they're not all interconnected to each other, at least in direct paths. Most of them are generally at some level. There's also a different in size. So you can see on there, there's one and that's clearly Kansas City, Missouri. That has over 150 disparate networks within it. So whether it's ISPs, long haul providers, um, the, the um, first mile, uh, middle mile, so middle mile, last mile, first mile, the content delivery networks, all kind of housing in there. Um, but the one a little bit just south of it uh, is Springfield. They have 11. So on the map, oh, there's two ISPs or IXPs there, um, but they're not the same. 
the one in Springfield is interconnecting a couple middle mile, last mile, and ISP providers. It's what uh, Representative Delford Dang brought up, which we call these things carrier hotels. Um, and so it is a very tiny, tiny carrier hotel with 11 rooms versus the really large one that has all the amenities, all the works, all the connectivity you want to go there. It's the difference between going to a resort and going to um, like a Motel 6 uh, in terms. They're both very useful, both very important, but they are serving fundamentally different purposes. They're not created equally. Additionally, one of the major problems Kansas has is because of our lack of, lack of IXPs, um, long haul providers don't tend to build through us. They build to connect from IXP to IXP to IXP. So you actually have more connectivity going up to Omaha and over instead of running through Kansas right down I-70 because they're connecting out there. And so um, it makes more sense. Additionally, we have like virtually zero connectivity running north south because the one that runs up Dallas runs up to Oklahoma City. Dallas is one of probably the five largest IXPs in the nation. Um, New York, Dallas, Chicago, Phoenix, I'm going to say Atlanta or Philadelphia, probably all the large five is five largest. Um, but they, why would they, you, we would think run up the highway system. That makes sense. Well, they don't because there's no IXP there. So what they actually do is they cut over to Tulsa and they run up the border. So they just skip Wichita entirely. Um, cause there's no point for them to run through Wichita building an IXP there, all of a sudden these long haul providers will say, oh, okay, now let's start running. So you would think if Kansas City goes down, it makes sense to go to Dallas. It actually doesn't because we don't have that connectivity running north-south at the same level that we should. Um, so we're going to reroute probably to Chicago or somewhere else. Um, it depends on the, re the redundancy of the system um, of where those, where Kansas City kind of reroutes to mostly as well. But it, it makes a huge difference in running those fiber lines. Additionally, they're not all equal because there's a difference between carrier neutral and non-carrier neutral um, IXPs. So, and like Representative Delvering brought up, an IXP can also be called a carrier hotel. There's, they can call it, be called a co-location, um, co-lo space. Um, there's a lot of different terms for it, but the, the internet exchange point is the, is the official term. Um, but they're not all equal because some are carrier neutral and some are not. Carrier neutral means anyone can connect into it. They don't play favorites. It, it's not run, administered by someone who is not neutral. So it's not an ISP that owns and manages it and says, okay, you three can connect, you three can't. Um, typically, they, uh, a, a true carrier neutral one will not have preferential pricing. Um, some companies that know they're going to be there forever, they negotiate very long contracts. So the price can go up over time, but they may have a better rate because they got in. But typically in carry neutral is if uh, Delperdang Fiber and Anderson Fiber are saying we both want to connect, they're going to get the same rate, the same terms, the same everything. You can't play favorites between the two of them. Um, that's the inherent nature of the neutrality of it. Um, a lot of the major um, ISP providers out there, the big national ones, they sometimes have in different regions their own um, – IXPs for their internal networks. Um, they are not carrier neutral, um, it, but that doesn't make sense for their model. So they, but they're, so you could have one say, oh, well, they have this, um, but it's for their internal use. It's not connecting out to all the additional networks. Or if they'd like to, they can, but they get to pick and choose and they get to pick and choose pricing. Um, the long haul fiber networks kind of can work that same way. You have major ones like Zayo, Metro, Hurricane Electric. I mean, there's, I can name tons of them. Um, they're out there to connect to everyone. Um, then you have other places where they don't connect, where I think Ideotech was talking about is you have other ISP carriers that have the long haul, their own internal, and you can buy off them, but they get to set the terms and the pricing. Um, so it does kind of create for a somewhat less competitive market potentially for that. Um, just like anything, if you only have one option, it's going to be very different than if you have two options, five options, 10 options to go through. It's just the, the nature of our uh, competitive markets, which I believe competitive markets are a good thing. Um, Trying to, I want to, okay. Uh, I mean, generally with that, I want to open that up to, to questions with you guys. I mean, our goal is we're in the works trying to get funding to build one in Wichita, um, uh, carrier neutral location in Wichita. It's a center point of the state, the largest city. Um, it, it makes the most sense to start building network there. But what we envision is naturally building 130 um, smaller IXPs than what you have in Kansas City 
but through in these tier two, tier three markets to create a resilient grid. And that's the question about resiliency is so that if one goes down, you're not having connectivity issues. It's just you have another one instead of saying, okay, well, if this goes down, that's our only one in a 300 mile radius. So now we're really in trouble. So does that map just show the tier ones? You so said that, there's tier two and tier threes. I mean, obviously, if there's that few in the nation, you don't expect to build 11 of those. In, no. You know, so yeah. this is just all the ones that kind of we had at the time. Maybe a couple smaller ones have popped up since. But these are all the IXPs out there. So you'll have an occasional smaller one in a smaller market. But they're not true IXPs. I mean, by definition, they are. But they're really just connection points only for one part of it. Connecting long haul or... Uh, First mile, middle mile, and last mile, but they're not fulfilling the carrier uh, delivery network portion of it, which is a, a huge aspect of it. So they may have, like, I think there's, um, like, the North Dakota one has like four or five people in it. So it's just, it's someone said, okay, we have a couple ISPs that need to connect. We're going to create a central aggregation point for this, but they're not fully, so it counts as an IXP on the map, but that's not the same as the four in New York City that have 200 to 400 networks within it. I, I just thought you said something about building 11 in Kansas, and I look at that map, and I think that's oh. not realistic. In Kansas, I mean, ideally, you would build Wichita first, probably Hayes second, um, just from geographic diversity and population size, so you're hitting regionals. And then I would say build one in the southwest, uh, something like Liberal or Garden City, uh, then probably Pittsburgh, and then maybe you come back and then on, on the back end do a Salina or a Manhattan. Can I ask, do, I don't know if you were involved in the grant preparation, but is the reason that the grant line went down to, I believe, Pittsburgh, it looked like, and then went over to Wichita was to ease uh, connections to that Tulsa line that you were talking about and the Springfield line, or why was it um, routed that way? I was pretty limited in those conversations because I was working on our own enabling middle mile grant application to for five IXPs throughout the nation, uh, partnered with Regent uh, uh, Universities. Uh, in five different states. Um, I don't think that was the main thing. I think it's more, it makes sense to connect your universities and your community colleges because they're going to be some of your highest bandwidth users in the entire state. So they also tend to be population centers. So, you, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's kind of trying to connect these key areas. It's like building a train system, right? Like you, you can't connect everywhere, but you want to try to get the best, most efficient route while getting the most people possible. Yeah, it just looked like it had been cheaper to go from Emporia to Wichita. Come to the mic, please state your name. Again. Yeah, so Thomas Garrett with Idea Tech. Sorry, the um, you know your matching objectives is the point I wanted to make. So, you know, K dot has objectives to build this infrastructure down. You know, primary and secondary freight routes where it where it needs to get it, and then you know there's the objective of connectivity and, and underserved communities. And so you'll, it's just like I mentioned with the project that we had where we were trying to connect schools, we moved our original route to match objectives of KDOT. So you're always trying to match those objectives. So the route was determined by multiple objectives and picking the most logical route to solve multiple problems. So, Representative Kelperdang, did you have a question or not? Or a compliment. Either is fine. Compliment for the prior uh, former rep. I didn't, but I'm going to throw one in. <laughs> and it's been a while since I've been in it, okay? But is Kansas City truly part of the Tier 1 backbone? Or is it a hotel to connect to go on up to Chicago? And uh, no, it, it, it is. Um, I mean, it, it started smaller. And actually, um, a smaller carrier hotel. People thought it was, you were crazy to put a carrier hotel in Kansas City at the time. And actually, it's a, a partner that our organization works with on these issues. His name's Hunter Newby. Um, he created some of the first carrier hotels and owned probably a very large portion of them at one point throughout the U.S. But he was like, no, Kansas City's key. It's not a you can call it a flyover state, but it is going to be the central hub for running connectivity east west or it could be. So he actually purchased it and built it out to a major care hotel. So the, if you want to look at like there's a website called Fiber Locator that we use, but you see the connectivity running through there. Like you will see all these names. You're like, none of these people exist here, except it's because they're all running to connect in there and their providers way farther out in the state. So if I may continue on, is that part of what you're envisioning for like Wichita area? Well, so um, I don't envision at least, I mean, we would love for it to become as large as 1102 grand. Um, that would be amazing for the region. But our model is, I mean, that's a, that's one of the largest carrier hotels in the U.S. So um, 
we're our model is a smaller model that's designed to fit the region. Um, it's one of the things that's cost prohibitive is a lot of people look at these things that are pretty much exclusively owned by private equity. Um, and they say, oh, we don't want to build that in Wichita. That works. You need 2 million people, you know, population for that to make sense. And so we partnered with Hunter Newby to figure out, okay, so how do we develop these for smaller markets that make sense fiscally for both the market um, and the people building them? Um, so it's, it's not going to be identical, but yes, what it would do by putting one in Wichita is you will have more long haul providers that will run to connect into it that then the middle mile and ISPs, I mean, at that point, some ISPs could say, well, we don't need to connect the middle mile. We're just going to run straight to your facility if we're close enough. The other ones, you have middle mile networks that will run out, but you'll reduce the transit costs considerably. And if, and if I could draw a comment back to Jade, I, when I asked you about the IP4, I meant to find out is can Ren run in that or are they on IP6 at this point? And, and, and just to follow up, you don't need to answer it now, but when you follow up, I'd just be curious because does it separate the CanRen network essentially from the normal ISP type networks? That's what I was after. So anyway, um, thank you. I don't know the answer to that question, but I can say that um, we've had extensive conversations with CanRen about our vision for Kansas. And they were one of the first people saying, sign us up. What can we do to help? We need this. And they actually helped us develop the initial map around the state of saying, okay, let's look at the network. Let's look at connectivity um, where a lot of the needs are. Here's how you, you kind of prioritize it out. And I know Cameron's been around for a long, long time. So, and, um, I, One thing I should add in my presentation, but um, the reason we figured this out is as a nonprofit, our goal is closing the digital, digital divide. We're trying to figure out how do you get more high quality internet access from more full prices across the state. We have no inherent interest in any, any side of it other than solving the problem. That's why we consult with states to help them do that. Um, what we found out was we had a contract in Iowa and the governor said, go take a consortium of school districts and figure out how to lower their internet wholesale costs. It's just, they're astronomical. Um, Iowa actually has quite a few data centers um, because energy prices are so cheap up there. And so we took an old data center that's actually where we got partnered with Hunter. We started looking at all these ideas. We took an old data center um, and made kind of a, a jerry-rigged uh, IXP. It's not a true carrier hotel, but it worked. We created an aggregation point for these long-haul providers to run into to connect out to these school districts, about 40 school districts in a region in northern, north central Iowa. Um, we lowered their price 90% um, and gave them access to speeds they'd never had access to before. One of the school districts, uh, their they're, the cheapest they could find was they had to, they were buying transit from Dallas was their best pricing, not even Chicago. Um, and so we created a central data, uh, aggregation point. Three long haul providers came in, connected in there and then competitively bid down. And so they were paying something around like 372 a megabit for speed. And they dropped that down to sub 20, uh, 20 cents. And so that's when we were like, wow. Okay. I think we figured out something that in smaller communities, we can help solve this problem. And we started putting focus on doing something that no one else had wanted to do, which is go try to build these in smaller communities. But instead of building one like we built in Iowa, building real um, IXPs with the full network. What you're referring to in Iowa, is, are you talking about the Iowa Communications Network or is it something separate? No, because it's something completely separate. We just created a facility to, so I think it was like Hurricane Electric, Zayo, I'd have to look up which ones. But these long haul carriers said, "Okay, well, if you build that, we'll we'll connect to it." And then all these school districts could buy transit costs off there. And it because instead they were they were buying locally instead of having to pay the long haul transit to all these different regions. That just instantly lowered their cost because the people built. To, I mean, if you build it, they will come. If you build these in the right markets, the long haul transit will run to them. All right, everybody, we're going to have to shut it down. I'm sure these guys will talk to you if they've got. Um, afterwards, if you have some questions, so next, uh, no meeting tomorrow. So, uh, everybody's got a break and then, uh, Wednesday, we're going to do road usage charges. We've got a number of presenters talking about the future of that and what the state's doing right now. And then Thursday, we're going to have hearings on HB 2019 and HB 2020. Uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>